everyone. Today we're going to present our work on bridging the terahertz gap with quantum cascade lasers. My name is Kathy. This is Michael, our other group member as well, and our advisor is Professor Diane Van. So this is the outline of our presentation. First, I'll give an introduction about this research field, and then I'll uh, then we'll talk about the three components of our project, which consists of the quantum design, thermal design, and optical design, and then we'll give some conclusions. So first, terahertz frequency range is roughly defined as uh, 0.3 terahertz to 10 terahertz, um, or equivalently 30 micrometers to 1,000 micrometers in wavelength. Um, so there are many applications for this terahertz range, such as communications, astronomy, uh, screening, chemical detection, and medical imaging. For example, in medical imaging, uh, the terahertz frequency range would be attractive because the terahertz is only around 10 sub MeV, so it would be a non-invasive method. Uh, however, there aren't any satisfactory terahertz radiation sources, which results in the terahertz gap in the electromagnetic spectrum. Our one promising solution is the terahertz quantum cascade lasers, or QCLs. So what are QCLs? Well, they're, <coughs> they're a kind of laser where the active region is made up of semiconductor uh, heterostructures consisting of periodic layers of quantum wells and barriers. Um, so here I show one example. This is uh, it's called F30, and it's the design that we're going with in our project. So the barriers consist of aluminum 0.15, gallium 0.85 arsenide, um, and then the wells consist of gallium arsenide. Um, so in this particular design, what happens is that, say, electrons start from here, and then they tunnel into the upper lacing state, followed by radiative transition emitting a photon, and then the lower lasing state is quickly depopulated by resonant tunneling and allophonon emission. And this process is uh, repeated for every module. So uh, the main research goal in this field is to improve the operating temperature. Um, so as can be seen in this diagram, the this is the terahertz range that we're interested in. The Tmax is around 200K in pulse mode, and this was achieved in 2012 and has not been um, improved since then. Uh, if, if we can improve the Tmax by 30K, the, it would then be good enough to use with thermoelectric coolers and would then open up more doors for our applications. So people have been thinking of ways to improve the Tmax, which uh, some of them include using quantum dots or different material systems. Um, however, the aluminum gallium arsenide, uh, gallium arsenide material system is the most mature in terms of the fabrication, uh, so we chose to go with this material system. However, we're also doing a detailed reevaluation design at every uh, stage or component. So these components are the quantum, thermal, and optical uh, components. So I was in charge of the quantum design. So um, it consists of designing the simulation tool, validation of the simulation, and um, application of the simulation tool. So there are several transport models uh, that are implemented in this field. I chose to go with the generalized scattering density, density matrix model. Uh, the main advantage of this model is that it uses the actual basis of the QCL. Um, so this here, I show the wave functions calculated using the delocalized or actual basis of the QCL, and here it's using the type binding uh, basis. So here I briefly explain this model. Um, so basically I write the density matrix equation for a particular defined a set of states of one module, and then I apply periodic boundary conditions. So in this equation, there's a coherent transport part and an incoherent transport part. Uh, the coherent part is coming from the device Hamiltonian, and the incoherent part comes from the scattering. Um, so what's different in this model from the other type binding density matrix models is that um, the, local, the localization of the electrons uh, behind the barrier comes from the scattering. Mm. 
So in terms of what the customer wants from out of this simulation tool, they want, want to be able to predict the maximum operating temperature. They would want to be able to predict the IV and the power. So in this uh, simulation tool, they can input the simulation parameters such as the quantum design information, so the, their, the barrier well thicknesses, and they can input the uh, temperature and um, bias they would like to simulate at. So first the model would calculate the band structure and then the wave functions and eigenergies would be input into the generalized density matrix model. And at this point, uh, they can output the observables such as the current density, gain, and power. Um, I had also added my improvements to the model which are calculating the leakage to the continuum. So I calculate the amount of carriers that are lost to the continuum and are therefore unavailable to contribute to the gain. Um, I also add an option to include electron-electron scattering and damping um, and this part of the code is still under development. So these are some results when I tried the model on some designs in the literature. So this one is an indirectly pumped uh, QCL design. So this is the LIV from the literature. So this uh, purple um, IV curve is at 10K and this is my simulation at 20K. Um, so qualitatively, they do agree with each other. Um, and the model was able to predict the Tmax pretty well. So uh, in the uh, experimental, they used a gold gold waveguide, uh, which resulted in Tmax of 138K. And in my simulation, I do get that the peak gain is roughly equal to the losses um, at that temperature. And then I tried the uh, model on a two-well resonant phonon-based design. So these are the experimental results. Uh, and again, the qualitative, qualitatively, the simulation results match with the experimental. Um, however, the gain was uh, overestimated. Uh, so for example, um, uh, uh, so but when I increase the amount of heating, um, the calculated peak gain is decreased and I get around 37 centimeters inverse at around 120K. And the experimental Tmax was around 120K. So next I uh, use the model to do a detailed study on the F30 design. So this is the literature results. Uh, these are my simulation results and these are recent experimental results um, from a recent growth and fabrication here at U Waterloo. So uh, in this uh, literature result, this is at 77K, and this is my simulated result at 80K. So uh, this red curve is the total current density, which includes the, this leakage to the continuum, as well as the simulated emission. Um, qualitatively, they do match very well with each other, and the amount of light in uh, light intensity um, do uh, agree with the published experimental result as well. Um, the model again worked well to predict the Tmax for gold gold waveguide. Approximately 160K was predicted um, and 160K was obtained in the uh, published result. And for a copper copper waveguide, which has a lower loss, um, 200K uh, was predicted. And then this is the uh, experimental lasing spectrum um, overlapped with the simulated gain profile. And um, we do obtain the expected uh, lasing frequency. So in terms of any possible improvements for F30, um, so I did a quick numerical test uh, to see uh, whether implementing higher aluminum barriers would decrease the leakage to the continuum. So I simply see what's the difference when there's no leakage to the continuum versus including the leakage to the continuum. So I saw that there was an improvement by 10K, so this direction is not really worthy to go in. Um, however, my suggestion would be to investigate the extraction control design scheme uh, QCLs um, was first originally proposed by Andreas Walker, who does the NEGF simulations, and 
Uh, in his design, he's using a lumen fraction of 0.3. Um, and while it did predict a uh, high gain at 200K, the, aluminum, the high aluminum fraction was most likely overkill because, well, we have really thin barriers such as 15 angstroms, uh, and it would be really hard to grow the high barriers and uh, the high and thin barriers. So, um, my simulation, I simply changed it to aluminum fraction 0.2 and just still using those same uh, quantum well barrier uh, thicknesses, I get a maximum gain of around 50 at 200K, which is much larger than the uh, 20 centimeters inverse for a copper copper waveguide. Um, and I saw that in my simulation it was coming mostly from the increased oscillator strength. Uh, so I'm, uh, so I'm be, I was charging in charge of thermal design. The thermal design splits into three parts, thermal simulation, uh, calibration, and parameters analysis. So in the simulation, we really targeted, uh, targeting th uh, two different scenarios. So one is steady state, and the other one is transient states. So in steady states, it, it helps us, give us uh, insights on how the parameters would affect the thermal profile, and in transient states, it helps us to determine the actual status of the device in the actual experiment status. Um, so in thermal simulation, so first of all, it's the thermal simulation and experiment. So in thermal pers perspective, to simplify the simulation, we can consider a four-layer structure of gold, active region, gold, and uh, substrate layer. The reason we can make this assumption is that under, when we're only considering thermal profile, um, only the dimensions of each layers and the thermal conductivity of the materials are really critical. So we can assume that uh, since the active region is made, uh, made by gallium arsenate with slightly doped aluminum, we can assume they're just uh, gallium arsenate with a different thermal conductivity uh, in the console. And uh, it's worth noting that the, uh, the left figure is the actual uh, device dimension in the console design and the parameters are used based on the research paper. So the right side figure are the results obtained from the simulation and the results are in line with the paper suggested, so it, it implies the paper is, uh, the model is correct. So then based on the verified model, we further move on with the, uh, with the, simula with the calibration side of the simulation. So it was difficult to monitor the thermal, the thermal profile under 35K because that requires using cryostat and the thermal profile measurement machine, which is we using microsange. And that machine mainly can be used under room temperature. So then we move on with um, the testing environment uh, inside the room temperature. Since the thermal conductivity of gold is known under room temperature, we only need to verify and calibrate the thermal conductivity of the substrate. Um, so other dimensions then I have to further calibrate into the actual device we have, which is F30. So the dimensions are increased, the substrate thickness increased to 300 microns. And the left figure shows the actual thermal profile distribution in the simulation using the substrate thermal conductivity under the 35K. So then we're using the microsense to uh, compute the results um, uh, of the actual substrate. And then we find out the changing temperature is around 12K instead of uh, 10K showed in simulation. Then we further calibrate, set the thermal conductivity of the substrate as a dependent and we observe the temperature changes in the maximum, uh, of the maximum temperature changes in the active region. Uh, by calibrating that, um, we, can further go, uh, we can further go into the left figure, which is um, the maximum active region under steady state using the calibrated results and uh, parameters compared to the original parameters. We can see that under only, uh, only eight watts, the temperature can vary for 20K. That would be significant if the simulation uh, needs to estimate higher wattage. So if the thermal conductivity is not caref carefully calibrated, then it could lead to errors in simulation, which potentially results in false, uh, in false information towards the testing. Then we move on with the time-dependent domain, which is, uh, which is transient mode. Um, uh, which, uh, which that's the DC. We have a DC supply uh, with, the, with the pulse. 
So this is, we have 50% duty cycle with 100 microsecond uh, period. Then we tried from 1 watts to 8 watts in the simulation. And we can observe that the maximum temperature in for 8 watts is actually 374K. And for under steady state, the, uh, the simulation suggests the maximum temperature is only around 364K. So we could actually see the in the time transient mode, the maximum temperature could actually uh, flux rate it and actually goes beyond estimation in steady state. So we need to carefully using the transient state instead of steady state to further, uh, further simulate the, the, the active region temperature. Um, so we're looking at possible improvements on thermal profile of the device. So there's two, uh, uh, two, uh, two different techniques we tried in the, uh, inside the simulation. So we first test the gold sputter for five, four microns around the active region. And we also tried to reduce the thickness of the substrate. And we can see from the result that sputtering helps by only a small margin of the thermal profile. And uh, reducing the thickness of the substrate uh, dr drastically decreased the, uh, the maximum temperature. But it's worth noting that uh, reducing the thickness of the substrate is a type of fabrication technique, and it could be really hard to accomplish in the lab. Uh, then it's the optical design. So this part is uh, responsible for, uh, well, is responsible for that. Um, so there are three main sections as well. So there are optical mold simulation, optical far field, uh, beam pattern experiments and the terahertz camera imaging. Next section will summarize the work done re regarding the beam pattern. Um, okay, so a 2D uh, simulation model has been set up using the radio frequency design module from Comsol software as well. In regards to the Comsol simulation, as the first step, we use the far field simulation for the QCL with the typical waveguide. So two waveguides were simulated and the detailed information is listed in the table. Um, uh, the active region is 10 microns, which is made of gallium arsenate. The width and the length simulated device is 80 microns and 2.2 millimeters. In order to simplify the simulation, um, we only need to consider a three-layered structure, which is gold, gallium arsenate, and gold metal layer. The reason we can make this assumption is an, also because in an optical perspective, it really matters is the, the, layer of, the dimension of the layers and the waveguide materials. And from the simulation results, we can clearly see three different modes. So, why, uh, so the, from left to right is fundamental mode, second order mode, and third order mode. Um, that's for 80 microns with metal, metal, metal QCL with temperature of 10K and 80K. And for optical far field beam pattern, the 1D far field experiment of the beam pattern of the QCL will be done using Cryostat just, and uh, Goalie cell. So the experimental setup is shown in the figure. And uh, after mounting the QCL device on the copper package, the device is placed in the cool cryostat. There are around 70% transparent terahertz frequency and laser radiation process through the polyethylene window. And this can be detected by the Golgi cell. The Golgi cell will analyze the terahertz signal into, uh, into electrical, electrical signals and send that signal to the amplifier. Computer then further acquire the data at the end. And since there's connection issues on the motion controller uh, device during the experiments, 1D far field pattern was measured manually, and the current supply was 2.7 M, and rotating stage with a range of 4 times 4 by 4 centimeters. The figure shows that 1D far field beam pattern for fundamental mode, although there are some unexpected noises, but overall tendency it was expected for uh, this F30, which is around 20 degrees to minus 20 degrees. So for terahertz Im imaging and black body infrared light source are used to capture terahertz images. So the, the operating temperature we used was uh, 1050 degrees and the after size was 10.2 millimeters. So high temperature provides this high amount, uh, high amount of light so uh, we can actually observe the terahertz and the infrared light much easier. And the figure on the left shows uh, when we don't apply a silicon wafer, a pure silicon wafer on the Aperture, so it have it has um, uh, infrared light uh, combined with the terahertz light, so which makes it brighter. And an image on the right side only has terahertz light, and using a metal uh, keychain, uh, because the metal doesn't uh, doesn't absorb this this um, uh, so metal will block the terahertz light, so that's why it's a black 
on the in, in the camera. And so for conclusion is um, so for physical consistent model implemented to calculate the performance characteristic of terahertz QCLs, it works remarkably well for F30 and more fine tuning for the, of the models. For example, the scattering time, uh, extraction of current density in order to accurately calculate uh, current density for weakly coupled anti-cross states. And the transient thermal profile is extremely useful to obtain active region maximum temperature. It reduces the risk of burning the QCL devices and has improvement uh, can be made either to sputter gold around the device or thin and substrate. That's just one last. Um, then the beam pattern emission profile of the terahertz QCL in metal metal waveguides is simulated and measured. The 1D and 2D far field patterns and uh, measured at 20K are in agreement with the simulation. And here's the acknowledgement to the teams. And thank you for listening.